You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome back to a very special, very wonderful episode of the Apple Insider Podcast. I'm your host, Victor, and joining me is Magic Mike Worthley. Hello again. Welcome back, Mike. Thanks. I am so glad you're here. And I, I want to tell you about Stitcher Premium for just a second. So if you haven't joined Stitcher Premium yet, now is the perfect time. Stitcher Premium gets you completely ad-free episodes of hundreds of shows like Comedy Bang Bang, WTF with Mark Marone, and How Did This Get Made? You also get 21,000 hours of exclusive content. New exclusive originals like Marvel's Wolverine and Issa Rae's Fruit are launching every week for Stitcher Premium members. If you love podcasts, you're missing out. And I should point out that we, the Apple Insider folks, are also available on Stitcher. And so that was uh, really handy when I was recommending someone go listen to us. And they came back and said, wow, I found you on Stitcher. And I was surprised and impressed that she used Stitcher. When you listen to ad-free episodes in Stitcher Premium, your favorite podcasters get paid. Help support your favorite shows and join Stitcher Premium today. So for a free month of listening, go to stitcherpremium.com and use the promo code APPLE. Mike, WWDC, big week, huh? Yeah, it is every year, and the magnitude of the week depends a great deal on if there's hardware or not, and this year there was none. And we, we sort of kind of knew that. The the only hints around hardware at all was maybe the possibility of an SE2, which we'd already discounted. Right, right. Yeah, we had speculated about that a little bit last week on this very podcast. So it, it's it just has a historical perspective. Again, it was three years prior to last year's hardware bonanza that there was nothing, not a single thing released. And if you head over to our forums right now at forums.appleinsider.com, there are a couple of threads where one of our forumers listed the WWDC since, geez, I want to say 2002 and everything that was released hardware wise during those WWDCs. And it's not a lot. There's a couple things here and there. There are new trackpads, for instance, on one series of MacBook Pros one year and a bunch of iPhones until they shifted to the fall release cycle. And, you know, that's about it. The, the reason that you release hardware at WWDC primarily is if it impacts an application. If, if you want people to take advantage of new hardware features to be able to develop for them, you need your developers to know about them. And so when you say new trackpad and it's the force touch trackpad, right? That right. makes sense because now you're saying, here's this piece of hardware. It's going to be on this machine. And if you develop for it, here's what you'll be able to do. That, that kind of thing makes sense. Some years, like you say, hardware bonanza, we've just gotten tons of stuff. And, and it's all been basically a consumer event with developer tacked onto it. Yeah, th this year was that. This year was a software focus, and I understand where there's a disappointment that there was no hardware, but I think this is very much like when Apple bailed out of the Macworld Expos. I, I think this is about Apple fully aware that they can control the narrative whenever they please, and they can throw a press event whenever they please, and everybody, Apple Insider, CNN, you name it, everybody will scramble to get people on the ground at the event. Yeah, and, and for phones, they're pretty much locked into a cycle. And they're locked into a cycle because carriers have upgrade plans or payment plans or things like that. So it's fairly predictable. And, and Apple knows as well as anyone because they have the Apple upgrade program. So they're, they're locked into a cycle for that. But for pretty much everything else, they can do whatever they want, whenever they want. Right. And yeah, I'd speculated in the forums. I had said that there's, and in an article about previewing WWC, WWDC, that there are a lot of reasons why Apple wouldn't necessarily want to upgrade their Mac hardware this time around at this WWDC. We'll see how those play out. Well, they've already sent huge, um, huge signals, huge flares up into the sky telling us what's going on, right? We got the iMac mm -hmm. Pro. Yep. We know that somewhere in their future is a Mac Pro of some form. Which they uncharacteristically talked about in April again this year after just lightly touching on it the previous April. And they sent signal flares that they aren't ignoring the Mac Mini, that something Mac Mini-ish will happen. Mm -hmm. We don't know when. Right. And they have closely paid attention to what's going on with their own MacBook and MacBook Pros and Touch Bar and uh, MacBook Air. They, they, oh, yeah. they know that line well. They know that people think MacBook is underpowered. They know that people mm -hmm. are unhappy with butterfly keyboard incidents on uh, on MacBook Pros. Mm -hmm. So one would expect that that's going to get revision, whether quiet revision or announced revision at some point soon-ish. I would be very surprised if Apple said anything 
publicly about a butterfly keyboard reduction. Oh, no, no. They're not going to tell us that there was anything ever wrong with the first one. But you know that they're going to announce a new Mac at some point, and it will have a revised part probably. Yeah, what's inevitable? Inevitable is a new iMac. Inevitable is a new MacBook Pro. Inevitable is a new MacBook. I, I believe you're correct about the Mac Mini, but I'm not convinced it's going to have an Intel processor in the next refresh. Didn't say it would. Yeah, uh, the Could be well, I'm just amplifying, right? So yeah. I, I think that a similar fate is destined for the MacBook Air. I, I think that it will be refreshed, but in what exact condition we don't know. Well, MacBook Air doesn't have to be refreshed, right? MacBook Air exists because you 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 just can't get that affordable on their current MacBook with a Retina display. Sure. And and I think that whatever the Mac Mini gets, the MacBook Air will get as well. I think they'll go lockstep. Right. I, I my, my thought was they want to get rid of the MacBook Air as soon as they can and just have sure. the MacBook. That's a possibility as well. I mean, there, there's a lot of the stuff that is still yet to shake out. The the final fruits of Marzipan, which I believe you guys talked about on the extra special episode of the Apple Insider podcast earlier this week, has been teased for release for developers next year. So there's there's a lot of things in the works, and I am still sticking with my conclusion that the whole the whole Marzipan making it easier to port iOS apps for the Mac, I still think that that's the early days of, of moving to ARM on the Mac, at least to some extent. Intriguing. I'm... Um... It makes sense, but it's it's not clear yet that that's exactly what will happen. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, there's. I mean, we're on step B of a of, of a twenty step multi year thing. Yeah, you know. So we we've got a long way to go before the mists clear and the haze lifts, and we can and we can see even step ten, much less step twenty. So you know, the, the, they they currently have UI Kit and App Kit, and mm -hmm. iOS apps use one of those, and OS ten apps use the other. And trying to, to first of all, make the iOS apps not second-class citizens on macOS is, is, you know, among the first 10 steps. And then getting everyone else on board with porting to that, that framework is a huge step. Sure. You know, you, you have a lot to do to get that going. So there's, this is a multi-year process. Mm-hmm. And, and I would fully expect that there are going to be compatibility layers for some time, the way that we had Carbon, the way that we had Rosetta, the way that we've had all these kinds of transitional technologies to help people get through that transition. Because, um, you know, the uh, now I'm blanking on it. I had it on the tip of my tongue, and the minute I thought of it, it's gone, right? The <laughs> um, not PageMaker, not InDesign, but the competitor. Not InDesign or PageMaker, but the competitor? Like Quark? Yes, Quark Express. Okay. Thank you. Well, the, you know, there's a reason why you didn't remember it. Uh, the, they they <laughs> took so long to update. I mean, when, when we got the Quark Express 12 notification, what, three years ago now? It had been years since there was a meaningful update to the application. Mm -hmm. So, And it took them forever to be able to port from, from Classic to OS X. That was partly their own fault. They went ahead and had fired all of their U.S. development team, moved the whole team to India, and said, we're going to work on Java now, and then had to go ahead and refactor for carbon. Yeah. I mean, I mean uh, there's, a, there's a lot of migrations, but some of these migrations took place in the dark days before Xcode, back in the days when there were Borland C and all kinds of Code different Pascal Warrior. compilers and Code Warrior was the name <laughs> of the game. So integrating everybody on Xcode makes a huge difference in this evolution process. I'm, I'm thinking off the top of my head, there were 10 or 11 different development environments when we did this from PowerPC from 68K to PowerPC. And then we lost a couple and then we gained a few more. And there were fewer than that when we shifted to Intel because Xcode had come out a few years prior. Mm. And now they're all gone. Now it's Xcode. Yes. It, I, I think there will still be products that are laggards or products that simply die before making that transition. Oh, sure. You know, there's there's a couple of those going on right now. We, we've got, let's see, 32-bit apps die with Mojave. But I want to point out DVD player dot app got updated to 64 yes. bit. Yeah. That surprises me a great deal. I thought that that one was going to get left on the side of the road. Let's see what else we got. We got OpenGL being deprecated in, in, in Mojave, which means that it's not going to be updated again. And Mojave will probably be the last one to use OpenGL and OpenCL at all in favor of metal. So, I mean, there's a lot of transitionings happening right now, and it kind of makes me tilt my head and look at it a little funny because this is where I said we're on, on step B, I should have said step two. This is where I said we're on step two of this process and there's a long road ahead of us. And 
these deprecations and these omissions point to something different in the future. Here's here's what I'm going to say about this. Apple gets accused by many people, including us, of standing still on some product lines. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a fair thing to talk about, especially when products have been out on the market for over a year untouched. However, this is them saying, we aren't standing still. We are making big sweeping changes. They are going to have impacts upon developers. They're going to have impacts upon consumers. And you, you can say that we're stale, but it's harder to make the case for Apple being stale when they're making all of these huge sweeping changes. Yeah. I mean, and that follows. It's, you know, I really didn't want to delve this deeply into this right now, but we're going to anyway, because it, well, it's a natural flow of the conversation. Let's do it quickly it's only and we'll take move on after that. Okay. Yep. We're only going to take a minute. Apple has a plan and Apple's plan is influenced by what companies like Intel can deliver. So when Apple's plan is influenced by Intel too many times, then it's got to start thinking about what are we going to do to make this sure that this doesn't happen again? This has all happened before. This happened with the Intel shift. Motorola and IBM kept on churning out lower than expected yields and lower than expected speeds year after year. What does that sound like now? The, the chipset that, that Apple needs to put 32 gigabytes of RAM into the next MacBook Pro, we're not going to see until until December. And that will that at that point, it will make it 30 months late by Intel. 30 months! So we can point at Apple and say, this is your fault, all we like, but it is to some extent, but not pointing the finger at other parties which are causing some of this difficulty is irresponsible. Right, but the difference is that when Motorola had their huge failing at this, Steve Jobs got up on stage and told everyone that it was Motorola that had let them down. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any explanation remotely like that today. I argue that that's step 10. You're saying that we don't get that until we have the replacement. And right now, we're nowhere close to that step. Steve didn't say it until he had the replacement. The Power Mac G3, when Motorola first let them down, yeah, he did. To some extent, but but when Mac OS, 10, Mac OS 10 nearly from the get-go, according to Steve himself, had builds on Intel. So he already had this future in mind when the iMac came out, at, at the very latest when the iMac came out, and very possibly earlier. And the Intel builds were about two two years after the iMac came out. The, um, the timing is never going to be quite clear on that, because Next Step had builds in the mid-90s. Yes, Next Step and Open Step ran on Intel in the and 90s. And Copland did too. And Copland did too. So Copland, yeah. Copland also did. But yeah, um, yeah Copland is a, is a Sylvester Stallone film. <laughs> Copland is named for Aaron Copland, the 20th century composer. Well, it's good. We all know what I'm talking about. The Appalachian suite, if you will. So the, it, it's uh, been a long time since <laughs> I even even thought about Copland. Yeah. From, on, from an Apple perspective, it's been, God, at least a decade since the last time I even thought about it. So yeah. But uh, but but Mac OS 10 builds started in 2000 when Jobs uh, when, when actually an engineer. There's a great story on Quora from the actual mm -hmm. engineer who was responsible for that, who um, showed it could be done. And Jobs said, "Holy cow! I've got a meeting in Japan with Sony. Go buy the best Vio you can and mm -hmm. build it for that. How long is it going to take? Two weeks?" And he had it in two hours. And th and then it took six years for him to announce it. So. I, I think from a forward-facing perspective, we and Apple are on step two. And I don't think it's going to take six years. I think it's going to take two. I think 2020 is the first year that we're getting ARM Max. I, I don't think it's this year, but we're, I, I think we're starting to see the early foundations built for it. Okay. You know, it's, it's entirely possible. And I, I think you're right. I think the signaling is there. Mm -hmm. It remains to be seen how these transitions move. Sure. I think one of the real benefits of, of doing this is that the Mac App Store, as much as they talked in, in the WWDC keynote about trying to revise and update and, and bring forward the Mac App Store, the Mac App Store has not been anywhere close to the success that the iOS App Store has been. And this is a way of bringing that success forward. Well, that's also more foundations, I think, were laid with that. With the, They obviously have opened up things in the Mac App Store and have made some changes in sandboxing requirements. If we've got Office coming, if we've got, if we've got Transmit coming, and a few other applications coming that have never been on the App Store. So I, I think it's a combination of factors. And, and, and again, I think this is another one of those flags, semaphore waving 10 miles out in the horizon that we're struggling to see, but, I, but it's one of those flags. 
Hiring is difficult. Have you ever tried to hire anyone, Mike? Not recently. Uh, you know, I I have hired a few people in my time. I've even actually interviewed and hired someone to be my manager, which was mm-hmm. a fun situation. <laughs> but it's it's difficult to sometimes do this, you know, whether it's finding the right leads or getting the right applicants or or just dealing with all this. It's difficult. And one of the things that I've been been finding out is that it doesn't have to be that hard thanks to people in uh in LinkedIn, you know, it, businesses are only strong as their people. And I, I find that each time you bring in a new hire, especially in a smaller organization, that that changes the culture, that the addition of a single person can change everything. And so it's so important to try and get the right hire. And LinkedIn, being the world's largest professional network, is a better way to find great talent. So 70% of the U.S. workforce is already on LinkedIn. Uh, they have quality candidates. Businesses rate LinkedIn jobs at 40% higher than other job boards at delivering quality candidates. You post to job boards and you hope you'll find the right person for your job. But how often do you actually check job boards unless you're applying for a job? Mm. So it's kind of an occasional thing. People don't live on these things. But people do go to LinkedIn all the time. And you already know that LinkedIn is this professional network. They have forums, they have boards, they have the the homepage feed. People are going there when they're not searching for a job. And that makes it a place where people go and regularly check. Because LinkedIn considers skills, experiences, location, and more to match and promote your job to potential candidates, businesses rate LinkedIn jobs 40% higher than other job boards. And 22 million professionals view and apply to jobs on LinkedIn every week in every industry. Go to linkedin.com slash Apple Insider and get a $50 credit towards your first job post. That's linkedin.com slash Apple Insider for $50 credit today. Terms and conditions may apply. So, Mike, we've covered a lot of inside baseball on Apple's product line and where we think mm-hmm. they're going and prognosticating. Let's let's talk about some of the things that actually did come out that we can be sure of. Sure. One of the things that was apparent throughout the keynote was driving home the focus on the user as the center of everything we do. Yes, absolutely. And and while that's always been Apple's ethos, uh, it was it was it's never been stated quite as plainly as that. And following from that, one of the things that I I want to talk about is the AirPods. There's a listen a live listen accessibility function, which uh, you know it started out in 2016 as a way to stream audio from hearing aids and be able to to make it work with AirPods and stuff like that, make it work with the iPhone like that. And with iOS 12, that assistive hearing technology is coming to the AirPods product for the first time. Yeah, this is a good ad. It's going to be rough on third-party hearing aid manufacturers, I think. We'll see what develops with time, because when you're looking at going into Price Club, for instance, and still dropping 1200 bucks on iOS-enabled earbuds, uh, not iOS earbuds, iOS-enabled hearing aids, right? Being able to do 90% of that functionality for less than $200 is a big deal. Well, and so there's a difference between a person who is diagnosed with hearing loss and needs proper prescribed hearing aids and a person who knows empirically that they have some loss but maybe don't need full-on hearing aids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so AirPods with this live listen feature is not expected to replace dedicated hearing aid equipment, but being able to enhance audio fidelity while cutting down on ambient noise is probably a huge thing. Yeah, I, you know, I disagree with your take on that. I think it is going to replace conventional hearing aids in many ways, if for no other reason than the social stigma. Because like it or not, there's still a social stigma associated with seeing a hearing aid in somebody's ear. And it, it's bogus, but it still exists. But on the other hand, there is not a social stigma seeing an AirPod sticking out of your ear. So I, I do think that there's going to be a fair amount of churn on this. I mean, obviously, time will tell, and being that Apple isn't telling us how many AirPods get sold, we're not going to know if we're going to see a boost after this feature comes fully to the OS. But this is fantastic from an accessibility standpoint. This is fantastic from getting rid of some of that social stigma. So there's nothing negative about this at all, and it's it's great that Apple did this. Right, but I, I can't sit here and say practically Apple is replacing hearing aids with AirPods. You know, if you have a medical need and it's a prescribed medical need, you probably ought to follow through on at least getting seen and getting oh, sure. it diagnosed properly. And, you know, to, to say, oh, just go out and use Apple AirPods feels a little irresponsible to me. It's also not a, an inexpensive process to get that done. And I speak of that in the middle of my mother-in-law dealing with that process. So 
like I said, I, I think that there's going to be when you can get a phone for 50 bucks or less a month from your carrier and you can get your AirPods and still listen to your music for much less. When you start looking at some of these medical bills that come in because of it, it it's it's a big deal. And I think if Apple takes 2% of the hearing aid market, I think they'll be thrilled. Oh, absolutely. And if it does actually solve that customer's need, wonderful. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, is there a social stigma from talking to someone who has AirPods stuck in their ears? Is the expectation that you should take them out when you're talking to people? Some of this m might just be the Washington, D.C. metro area, but th no one seems to care. It, 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 you've got your earbuds in or your AirPods in. It, people will talk with you and... You can take them out or not, and it doesn't seem to. There doesn't seem to be any huge issue with that. It's just the the social stigma with the hearing aids has just been just been personal observations that what I'm seeing in my experiences with mass transit and professional environments, people will talk to someone who's got the earbuds in rather than the hearing. Aid. Hmm. Empirically, we know that that yes, there are people that totally discriminate against folks wearing assistive yeah. devices. Mm -hmm. That that I I not challenging that at all. I'm just curious because I always felt awkward talking to people with Bluetooth headsets on, for example. And mm -hmm. because the, the question is, are you listening to me or are you paying attention? How can you hear me when you have stuff in your ears kind of thing? <laughs> well, I think given given addictions to devices, I think that's a relevant question anyway. I, I'm not sure that there's more of a distraction from having, the, having any kind of earbud in than there is having a phone in your hand. Mm. So it, it's, but I mean, that's something else that Apple's looking at this WWDC too, so... Yeah, speaking of having phone in your hands, that's where we're going next. So this is something we, we talked about screen time a little bit with Dan at the beginning of the week. Mm -hmm. And on Twitter, David Chartier, who is uh, a fellow who used to write for ours a couple of years ago, commented that he wasn't sure it was Apple's responsibility to guide us or teach us to, to not use our phones, that we ought to be responsible for ourselves. And I think Apple's walking a very fine line here. One of the things that Tim Cook said in the keynote was that they want to be able to present the information to users so that users can understand where their time is going, where their time is being spent. And that if you need that help to curb your time, that Apple will give you the tools to help you do it. But I, I don't think they're telling you what you should or shouldn't be doing yet. I, I agree with that completely. We actually have a piece on Apple Insider that as we record this is going up in 15 minutes. Seconds. Seconds, people. So by the, by the time that you re, you listen to this on Friday over the weekend, the piece is already going to be ready, and we delve into everything that iOS 12 ha is doing to make your life easier, but it relies on a couple of different things. Apple is giving you the tools, but how you choose to wield that very good tool is completely up to you. You can wield it properly, or you can wield it like a complete chucklehead. And if you use it poorly, it's not going to help you. And if you if you use it well and are aware that it is a good tool and the data that it gives you is solid, then it's going to help. It's going to help restore life balance if you have a, if you have a problem with iPhone use. But if you keep on tapping that ignore this limit button, it's not going to help you at all. It's not going to do anything for you at all. I argue that this is more about Apple keeps getting yelled at about more controls for children. Well, their controls for children have been abysmal for years. They have been abysmal, but I, I have always been of the perspective that the controls are good enough and responsible parenting is 90% of this battle. The controls are not good enough. And even if you're a responsible parent, the tools can help you better. Uh, well, yes. they sh And they have been awful for too long. They have been bad for years. They were untouched for years. And we talk about stale Apple. That's a good example of stale Apple. Mike, Apple destroyed your Apple Watch. It did. Uh, putting on... It, it's partially my fault because I put it on for the, the beta for work. I put on the watchOS 5 beta so I can talk about it intelligently with the rest of you. And it promptly bricked my watch. And I said, okay. And I talked with Apple about it. And they said, okay, I, yeah, I'm making an appointment with the Genius Bar and we'll deal with that for you. And then about four hours later, Apple pulled the update in its entirety, uh, saying that there are people having problems with their Apple Watches. And, well, the Apple Watches are getting bricked. As a reminder, uh, this is the kind of bugs that are supposed to be found in these operating systems. And like we discussed on Monday, there are a host of problems with this. Our video crew is experimenting with rendering videos on Mojave, and they're having problems with videos completing. They do complete, but the last 2% is taking ages to get done. So these are betas. We are taking the, the risks so you don't have to. If you have mission-critical hardware, do not, do not 
install these betas on your mission critical hardware. I cannot stress that firmly enough. And the problem with the Apple Watch is that there is really no way to recover it. The only answer is go right. make your appointment with the Genius Bar where they will exchange it and then they will go ahead and service your old watch. There is no DFU mode that you can access to reload your watch. There is no way to recover from this other than go into a store. So, yeah, don't do this. So, I mean, I had a similar problem with my I, my primary hardware for work. Excuse me. <clears throat> my primary hardware for work is a 2016 MacBook Pro. I have a 2015 and a 2012 MacBook Pro, both Retina, that I use betas on, you know, as the whole do not install betas on your main hardware. And what I ultimately had to do on both of those pieces of hardware is I had to downgrade the machines to Sierra, reformat the drives in Sierra to non-APFS drives, and then install the Mojave Beta on top of that after I had reinstalled Sierra. So the upgrade path from High Sierra was not there. The, the upgrade path from High Sierra did not seem to function well for me on a 2012-2015 MacBook Pro. And in both cases, downgrading and then re-upgrading was the solution that fixed the problem. Now, these machines I beat on in the interest of testing. These these machines are thrashed. They're run for long periods of time without reboots to see how well the operating system holds up to things. I plug in 10,000 different kinds of hardware to see what works and what doesn't. So uh, there are a lot of things that I do to these machines for for to talk about so I could, we can talk about them on Apple Insider. So your mileage may vary on this, but I haven't seen that many cases where 2016 or 2017 MacBook Pros have had the problem to Mojave, but you know, the, it happened. And like I said, I've got three testing devices and they all got eaten by betas. So again, if you're making money with your machine, don't do it. I want to let our listeners know about Udemy. Udemy is the largest marketplace for online learning. Whether you want to learn something new or just sharpen your skills, Udemy has an extensive library over 65,000 courses taught by expert instructors. And if you ever find yourself thinking, I wish I could do that, with Udemy, you can. From web development to digital marketing to Japanese cooking courses, Udemy has something for everyone. Mike, how's your Japanese cooking? Very bad. You got to walk? I do. All right. I think, I think what we ought to do is we ought to go ahead and try and take a Japanese cooking course. You game for that? <laughs> Not this week. Let me get through this week and next week with WWDC and the Fallout, and then we can talk about it. All right. You heard it here. With other online learning companies, they charge hundreds of dollars per class. Udemy courses start at eleven ninety nine. Plus, every course comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee for risk-free learning. Every day, students around the world choose Udemy to discover new passions, expand their skills, or even change careers. Improve your life through learning. Download the Udemy app to learn anytime, anywhere, or visit ude.my slash Apple Insider. That's www.ude.my slash Apple Insider. Now, one of the things that developers have been asking for and, and users have been asking for is the ability to try software out in the App Store. Originally, you you bought something and that was it. And you could not return it come, come hell or high water unless mm -hmm. you really pressed against the Apple Store uh, representatives, the App Store representatives who would sell you things like, well, just this once a one-time exception kind of thing. The I Am Rich app, for instance. Oh, hey, that was a beauty. That was a $1,000 application that showed a pretty jewel on the screen that you could tap. Yep, that was fun. And do nothing. And and yeah, you couldn't return that. The um, Then they went ahead and said, okay, you can do returns, but you still have to contact and ask for them and explain why you want the return kind of thing. And now we are finally getting free trials of games and other apps coming to the App Store. And... I, from a customer standpoint, this feels good. If something is properly priced as a $30 application or a $50 application, mm -hmm. you want to be able to get a trial for it. And in the past, the ways that developers have kind of tried to allow that to happen is by making a free version of the app that is either feature reduced or is time limited for some features. And then after that time period, you have to go ahead and pay for a one-time subscription which upgrades it to the full version. But these are sort of workarounds and tricks. So so what's happening here to change that, Mike? Well, actually, as it turns out, not a whole lot. Apple has codified these workarounds and tricks for a TimeGate in-app purchase for an application. But the developers really aren't that jacked about it. As far as they're concerned, this is just acknowledging that the workaround exists and is not really doing anything to combat the main problem. And we, we're we going to put this in the show notes, but earlier on Thursday, a couple of developers were chatting on Twitter about how this puts a lot of the load on the developers as opposed to where it needs to be in this case, 
where they're apps which are not inexpensive apps, but I, you know, that's fine because it costs money to make quality software are listed in the free section. And then they get kickback from users saying, well, this is free, but now I have to pay thirty nine ninety nine to unlock this. This is garbage. Right. When in actuality, it's not. In actuality, it's a thirty nine ninety nine app with no way to give you a, a time limited demo. So, so what's happening here is that the onus is on the developer to create a, free, a separate free version of the app and set up the subscription that enables features, which mm-hmm. takes code that that takes yep. additional work, as opposed to Apple changing the way the store is implemented to say that for all of these applications or for whatever application gets a check in the, the when an app is published by the developer, for example, so let the developers have the choice to offer it as a free trial. And then after a period of time, the app store handles enabling the features or turning it on as opposed to the developer having to code two separate versions. Yeah. And uh, I'm with the developers on this one. I I think that this is a stopgap measure. I would like to see Apple change it, but I don't think they're that interested in changing it or they would have done it earlier. Uh, Or they have their focus on other things. Right. And what, what they're telling the Mac users is they're saying, well, then just serve it yourself and deal with it yourself. I'm not sure that's the best answer. I think this is one of those cases where history provides an impediment. You know, the way that you've always done things can sometimes influence the way that you continue to do them in the future. And this is the way the App Store has been. So changing it means changing it incrementally rather than changing it in a fell swoop. And we we are used to expecting larger sweeping changes from Apple. And, uh, and, and so there's some dismay that that hasn't happened here. Mm-hmm. But the App Store has been one of these things that's been kicked around from executive to executive, from yeah. team to team. And I, I think it's going to take something big to cause whoever's in charge of it this week, I believe it's Phil this time, to uh, Phil Schiller, that is, to push for that kind of change. What you're saying is the developers need to make more of a ruckus because they've been pretty loud about it already. When the ruckus isn't loud enough to have caused the change – then it it means that some other form of pain needs to be felt to inspire the change. Mm. And that's, that's, uh, you know, it comes in the form of bad press or it comes in the form of lost profits or lower profits, or it comes in the form, one one of these kinds of things has to happen to get the attention where the, the requests and the ruckus so far hasn't. Well, we're talking about it, so we'll see how it goes. Yes, that's right. The mighty influence of the Apple Insider podcast will <laughs> bring well, it's not just Apple Insider. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that this catches up more traction, right? Yes. Because everyone yeah. talked about how Apple's now offering free trials, and the developers all said, whoa, 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 settle down there, Hoss. It's it, Yeah, that isn't exactly so. And, and so we, we talked about it this morning, about it more, and let, let's see how we can keep this going here. Let, let's see what we, can, what we can get done on this. Yeah. Now, in terms of changes that are being made, Apple has removed Facebook and Twitter integration from macOS Mojave. Mm-hmm. That began in iOS 11, where it these did. third-party accounts came out, and now it's continued across to the Mac. Good. Uh, I, I, I see no compelling reason to keep it there. I didn't see a compelling reason to have them in share sheets in the first place. And here we are, and now they're being taken out after, God, Mountain Lion. They came out in Mountain Lion. Yeah, these these things were happy. Well, they, these things were, were parts that actually came into the system, I think, when Jobs was still around for mm-hmm. iOS. You know, it was iOS 4 that we got Twitter and Facebook integration. And the idea was that's where all your friends are and you want to be able to share photos to it. And so we created share sheets and they gave us share sheets with with things directly to your Twitter and Facebook. Yeah, well, didn't like it then, don't like it now. So yeah. I'm I'm fine to I'm have no impact on me having it seen stripped out. So. Right. The, the the reason why it works is at that time we didn't so we had the integration first and then we later got share sheets. And so the integrations were there to allow us to be able to send photos and things to our Facebook friends, to Twitter friends, without the implementation of share sheets. When share sheets came around, we didn't need those integrations anymore. Sure enough. And and so now it's finally being stripped out. And and I agree, we're probably safer for not having them. But um, I, th- I think it's kind of important to remember how we got there in the first place. It wasn't that Apple thought they were harmless all along and suddenly decided it was okay to to implement them and now it's okay to take them out. It's that there were different goals at the time that they were first implemented. And, and yeah, I'm just not certain that even then, it, it didn't seem particularly wise even then to automatically share stuff to a social media service. Well, they didn't automatically share. They just had the uh, account details set up so that you could share to them. Oh, let, me, let me refine my position then. It didn't seem wise to simplify the process to make it easy to post 15,000 images to, to, to Facebook. 
this is just me speaking. Obviously, I can't speak for everybody, but, you know, I've already made my point clear in this. I'm glad it's gone. I, I will not mourn its loss. Okay. How about that? Safari extension is going away as well. That's a mix. I'm of a mixed mind about that. I, I think that this this pushes more towards Apple's look, the web is garbage and let, let us help you with it point of view. But on the other hand, Safari extensions, they they can be valuable. And I'm not certain yet on this that this isn't throwing out babies with the bathwater. I, I think it is, but I think they have limited amounts of choices in terms of what they're going to do it, unless they want to take on the role of screening every single extension. Right. Which they probably don't. Well, I guarantee you they don't. It, 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 does it work? Yep. Is it not inherently hostile? Yep. Okay. But we're, you know, I, that's about the best they could do about that, just given how everything else slips by. And then there's always distribution on third parties of Safari plugins. So uh, we'll see. I'm, I'm going to form an opinion on this more as, as we go on and we see how this evolves over time. Right. What we're heading to is a... Uh, uh an OS that is so completely locked down that you you don't get extensions, you don't get you know you have the the gatekeeper and sandbox um, apps can only be installed from the app store kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It 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 becomes really quite rigid. You just, yeah, uh, no, I I don't disagree. I, it's just this is a tough this is a tough time. This is where I think threats are outpacing OS manufacturers in many ways, and I think that. For Microsoft and Apple, it's both a situation on what exactly we're going to do to protect the user versus what exactly we're going to do to keep things open for the user. I, I don't want to see a future on on Mac or Windows-based PCs where the only place you can get applications from are their respective app stores. But on the other hand, I also don't want it to be the wild frontier and anybody can install malware at any time. I, I would like the users who are unable to make determinations on if this email they just got from a Nigerian prince is safe or not. I would like those people be restricted, but the people who can make that decision, I'd rather they not be restricted. And it, it's a tightrope. It, it's, a, it's a hard walk to walk for any operating system manufacturer. So true. It is a difficult one. And, and you know, I... Um... I dabble in Linux. I dabble in Windows as well, and it's uh, it's, it's it's one of these very much striking a balance things. You know, do you want to have mm-hmm. the ability to compile your own software and run anything you absolutely want, or do you want to have the ability to run whatever you get from whatever sources, or or do you want to have the ability to know that your system is trustworthy? Yep. I mean, you, you'd think with the stuff I write at Apple Insider that I still bleed in six colors, but there are several Windows PCs in this house. I'm, I'm, my primary entertainment machine is an Intel NUC. So take that as you will, I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I've spent the past week with Windows XP, Windows 7, Windows 10, and about 10 different VMware player machines. Yeah. And and boy, do I regret my life right now. <laughs> I've also been fighting with Raspberry Pis and Homebridge on Linux as well. Yeah, I just, I can't muster up time or the inclination to really do anything with the Raspberry Pis. I just, I'd like to, but it's not high on my list. Pi is wonderful, but Homebridge is is not. And and part of the reason is, well, Node, Node.js. And part of the reason is, like anything that's a, a modular system that relies on plugins contributed by third parties, your plugin quality can vary wildly. And so I've got my ceiling fans working correctly in Homebridge. I had at one point a couple of months ago, I had all of my lighting controlled in home in, in Homebridge, but I had to reinstall Homebridge and I had to reinstall the the OS, and uh, those lights no longer function, mm. and I just haven't been able to get them back. And so I was going to move over to Home Assistant, which is another competing project, and get them running in Home Assistant, and then use Home Assistant to tie into Homebridge and be able to control them through HomeKit, which totally is supposed to work, except that you run into the same problem of quality of plugins for Home Assistant, where there it's some guy using three different Docker images, and Docker is somewhat of a virtual machine kind of thing. So three different virtual machine computers, one for status, one for pairing, and one for uh, control. And, um, and, And that didn't work out so well either. So right now I have none of my lights working, but I have mm. a ceiling fan that works with its light kit. So there's that. <laughs> yeah, Andrew did a video of using the Raspberry Pi on how to make a home kit camera mm-hmm. using the Raspberry Pi. And if you look at the forums and you look at people saying, well, this didn't work when I did this, yeah. there are so many variables. And this kind of goes back to the whole locked in system concept mm-hmm. where how many paths do you need to get to the same point? Do you need a hundred or will 10 do? <sighs> well, 
it, you know, I, I, it gives me more hope for the, the ability to do home kit authentication in software. Yep. Because so the light switches that I'm talking about here are called SwitchMate from a company curiously named myswitchmate.com. Hmm. And the cool thing about them is that they're dead simple. They're Bluetooth low energy. They're basically a DC motor with a, uh, a worm gear screw that m- motorized operates the toggle on a light switch. Yeah, you've been talking about these before. Mm-hmm. Love them. They're so great because you don't have to open your electricity. You don't have to take off a wall plate cover. You just slap them on the wall and call it a day, which is great, except trying to get them to talk to HomeKit. Mm, I can see where that would be a problem. Yeah. You know, I, I I did the ceiling fan wiring. I took down the the canopy cover for that and wired it in. But, you know, to spend 50 bucks on, on you know, uh, Lutron Cassetta wireless switches all around the house or to spend 50 bucks for Koo Geeks or, you know, each one of those things involves wiring and involves another 50 bucks per switch yeah. versus mm-hmm. the 20 the some that I can do for the magnetic thing that just goes on. So this is really what it comes down to. And I think that's part of why home kit adoption is slower than it might otherwise be is because the cost and the slowness to certify. Yeah. I also think that that's related to planning out a system. I, I think that unfortunately the costs involved in a home kit system can get really, really steep once you start looking at beyond one or two devices. Yes. So, and we didn't get a whole lot of home kit talk in this WWDC. The, the two places that I noticed it were in Siri shortcuts Yep. And in macOS Mojave. Yep. In, in the home app on Mojave, which they use the Marzipan frameworks to port over. So it, it's, yeah, there's not, there, I didn't see a lot of improvements. Obviously, there's a lot of time between now and when these operating systems fully launch the public in September or October. And there's going to be a lot of iterations in the betas in between. So it, really to keep on top of this, just keep on coming by appleinsider.com and we'll hook you up. Yeah. So the, the beauty of Siri shortcuts and home kit is that it means that that you get to be able to do custom things with it for your HomePod. And Siri and HomeKit have been missing on Mac for ages. That's one of the things that Neil Hughes used to moan about was that he could have Siri on Mac but not talk to HomeKit devices. Well, have him on again. I'm sure he'll he'll talk about it some more. Oh, I'm going to. I want to get him back to hear about that because I know he's excited about it now. I'm, I'm sure he is. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't spoken to him specifically about it because it's been a busy week, but yeah. Yeah. And speaking of AirPlay, because we're talking about HomePod, uh, AirPlay 2 is coming to the Sonos 1. The Sonos 1, the Play 5, and the PlayBase are all going to get AirPlay 2 compatibility, Sonos has announced. More is better. I'll take it. More is better. Well, and I think this is good. Now, the Sonos 1, the 1 is a relatively new speaker in terms of their product line. Mm-hmm. But the Play 5 and the PlayBase are products that have been around for ages. Well, that's what software authentication will do for you, since these are HomeKit devices. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to see that those ones are going to live on. Well, coming up next, we have an interview with a person who wrote a book about the history of Mac gaming. We'll tell you all about it in just a few seconds. It's going to be great. Stay tuned. Joining us now is Richard Moss. And and Rich, you're in Australia. Yes, I am. So this is a little bit different because it's still evening the day before for me and morning for you. So for our listeners listening in, that, that creates a weird sort of juxtaposition because we're in very different settings and contexts in the world. Now, Rich, the reason that we're talking is because you have written a book, which on its own is a monumental task. So <laughs> congratulations for doing that and for actually getting it published. Yeah, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Uh, okay, yeah. It's uh, it's called The Secret History of Mac Gaming. Uh, it is obviously a history book. Um, it It's about um, the Macintosh in the 1980s and the 90s, so the classic era before OS X. Um, and it's full of behind-the-scenes stories about uh, dozens of games from that era. Um, some, of, some of these games were very significant. You have games like Myst uh, that, that went on to become massive hits uh, on, on the PC side. Then you've got other things that are that never really made it out of um, the little tiny Mac community. Um, games like Glider and um, Crystal Quest uh, is one that is another one that got further out. Dark Castle is one that uh, it, it got released on other platforms, but pretty much everything was crap except for the Mac version. 
um, and it tells it tells the behind the scenes stories of how a lot of these things were made, uh, and how the this little tiny Mac community worked, and what what made it interesting, what made it tick, and how the innovations of the Macintosh, I guess, spurred them to do better and to innovate themselves. And so that's how we ended up with uh, mouse-based input and multi-window interfaces becoming standard in games, uh, kind of mostly as a result of things like the Mac Venture system, uh, adventure games like Deja Vu and Shadowgate, uh, which many people will have played, uh, on other platforms. Uh, they, they were released on the Nintendo Entertainment System as well. Uh, and you have, before they made Myst, Robin and Rand Miller, they made some educational games, uh, the first of which was called The Manhole. And it's one of the earliest uh, point-and-click adventure type games that didn't really have an interface. Uh, and then you've got... Um, Possibly the first instance of professional voice acting in games in Dark Castle. Uh, some wonderful stories of creativity from people uh, figuring out how to deal with the limitations of the system or just of the way the world worked at the time. Uh, with Spaceship Warlock, they were sending a hard drive across the country because one of them is in, uh, I think, San Francisco or San Diego or something, somewhere in California. The other one was up in Chicago. So they're on opposite sides of the country. And they are making a CD-ROM game before CD-ROM burners are affordable. They don't have $30,000 to buy one. So instead, they put the game on a hard drive and they ship the hard drive across the country, back and forth, as required. And then finally, at the end, they ship the hard drive, which is their only complete copy of the game, to the um, the press factory, the CD-ROM place, that will get it printed to a gold master for them. Yeah, the, the fastest way of transmitting data, right? The fastest bandwidth is if you put a load of hard drives in a car and barrel it down the freeway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and this, this is the day of, this is like 1990, or thereabouts. So this is the days of of four hundred board BBS stuff and like really slow connections. We had in ninety. We had uh, gosh, we had thirty three six and twenty eight eight. Mm. Well, even so, it would still be it's, exceptionally it's still nightmarishly <laughs> slow when you've got a you know a forty meg hard drive that you could ship across the country. Mm. Yeah. So I think they sent they sent little files to each other over the internet, uh, such as it was back then. And whenever they had something bigger, like the 3D models, or just the entire game, they had to go back and forth. Wow. Yeah, and and the internet, such as it was back then, wasn't really an internet at, at that point. We had we had CompuServe and we had Prodigy and we had uh, FidoNet, which was a weird sort of ad hoc system where we had all these local dial-up BBSs, and then at night they would go ahead and dial each other and exchange messages across them so that you could send a message from one BBS to another oh. and it sort of relay along the way. That's really cool. I haven't heard of that one. Oh, yeah. No, it, it, it was something that, that was in that 1990 to 93 time frame before the, the internet really got to be something that, that anyone could dial into. You know, we had, we had, Trumpet Windsock for, for TCIP really only kind of seemed to catch on around 93, 94. And that's when Mosaic was hitting it as a browser as well. So it, it was really, um, before that, all dial-up BBS kind of stuff. Mm. And that, that reminds me that um, people who uh, put online in those early days, uh, there, there's stuff in the book for them as well. Uh, there's a game called Bolo, which was very, very popular. Um that was a game played over the internet and pretty much only over the internet. It's like a tank shooting game. Um, and that was that was leaked out uh, while it was in development. It was a, to be released as shareware, but it was leaked out early. <laughs> and the developer decided that he wouldn't charge shareware his shareware fee until the the game was done. So it was leaked out in like nineteen ninety or late 80s, something like that. And I, 
a year or two later, he finally finished it and started ch- charging people registration fees. And at its peak, I think it had thousands of players every month. And, and even earlier than that, we have some of the earliest LAN parties were, were on the Mac because of the, the Apple Talk um, mm-hmm. configuration. Uh, I found one story from 19... When was Apple Talk introduced? 85, I think. Um, where when the protocol was, was announced, these guys made their own box um, because there were no computers that had it built in yet. So they just, from the specifications, they made their own and they installed it on a bunch of uh, Mac 128Ks or 512. And they took these to a pizza shop uh, near near Macworld that in January that year, and they had a they had one of possibly the first LAN party in this pizza shop. Hours upon hours of playing Maze Wars. Wow, you know my my first LAN gaming experience ever was on a Mac. I uh, I was in uni at the time, and some friends and I drove down to uh, UIUC, which is is the uh, University of Illinois, mm. where Mosaic was invented, and they had a Mac lab, and they had Mosaic on the Mac there, and we we quickly got away from Mosaic, and they loaded up some game that I don't even remember what it was, and we had six machines all playing this game, and I had never done that before at that time. Mm. I wish I even knew what game that was. I was kind of hoping you were going to say something that was for my memory. <laughs> I don't know. It, it could have been a number of different things, because it's very quickly... You had a bunch of games that had networking capabilities coming out commercially. Um, that that little that first story I told of of Maze Wars that was uh, using two different versions of this game. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't know, um, Maze Wars originated uh, in the nineteen seventies on um, mainframe computers, and it was um, played over the ARPANET. And then in the mid-70s or in the 80s, it moved over to Xerox Alto. And that version was played by some people in the Macintosh team. And two different people separately made their own version of that. Uh, They didn't know about each other. They're in different groups in the Macintosh team. So one of them made a game called Bust Out, uh, B-U-S apostrophe D, and the other one made Maze Wars. And both of those things were played at this LAN party. And Maze Wars then became Maze Wars Plus, which was a commercial game. Very cool. So let me ask, can you tell me about, you know, what was the, the story that seemed most interesting to you? What was the story that, that really surprised you? Ooh, that's tough. Um, uh I don't know if I can if I can boil it down to just one. Um, I'll give you one that one of the first ones that comes to mind though um, is the Silicon Beach software guys. So they made Dark Castle, and before that they made Airborne. Uh, they they wanted to get some voice digitized voice into their first game, Airborne. Uh, but they didn't really know how to do it. So uh, basically what you have was Charlie Jackson, the founder of Silicon Beach, who's doing the game design on Airborne, uh, says to Eric Socker, one of his programmers, I want uh, the soldier to say, Airborne, sir. How do we do that? I've heard um, Apple II games figure out a way to to make these kinds of sounds with, with like sine waves, square waves, and things like that. Can you figure out how to do it? So Eric Zucker then digs into the big inside Macintosh manual to try and figure out how do we do this. And he found pretty quickly that the Macintosh had a, a built-in synthesizer, so it's technically capable, but he didn't know how he would produce this sound. So then he thought, okay, I'll make a recording. Um, so he got a microphone and he made some recordings of the kinds of sounds he wanted. And then 
he's like, well, how do I now take these recordings and figure out a way that they will get into the computer? And he did some further digging and found out that actually the Macintosh has built-in capacity for um, digitals, playing digital sound samples. So you don't have to have the Mac generate the sounds. It can actually play recorded samples. The only thing is no one had ever tried it before because no one had got those sounds onto there. So they went to a local university and they and they got their sound samples onto a mini computer and they wrote some software that would transfer that 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 would downsample at first. Uh, so it was I think 16 bit they made it 8 bit. It was um, 22,000 uh, kilohertz, they made it 11. And then they used uh, an acoustic coupler and and a, a modem of some kind to transfer that data onto a Macintosh 128K. And Eric had written his own custom sound driver based on what information he could find. And then they, they made the sounds play. It didn't end there because it turned out once they got their sounds into the game that sometimes the Mac speakers would pop. So you'd have this lovely music playing or some sound effects and then suddenly pop, pop. And it seemed kind of random, but it happened a lot. And so then they they went into this audio editor that Eric had made and they went one sample at a time, just kept adding to the length of the file. And Eric is standing behind Charlie, who's doing this, and and he's got his calculator, and eventually he's, he goes, ah, I got, I've got it. And he says that the, the audio buffer has to be full. So there's a 384, I, I might be getting the number wrong, there's a sound buffer on the Mac, it had a certain length, it had to be exactly full, not a byte less, not a byte more. And you had to fill it in the time it took the vertical retrace beam to get back up to the top left corner, ready to draw again. So during this interrupt that they call it, uh, so that the the thing inside the CRT monitor can go across from left to right and down, top to bottom, and draw. Yeah, the scanning electron yeah, draw beam. The, draw the screen in the time it takes that beam to go from the bottom back up to the top. They had to fill the sound buffer. So I, I thought that was a, a fantastic little story of uh, dealing with technological limitations and, and wondering if something can be done and then just figuring out how to do it. Yeah. Now, the the, the Mac was a pivotal moment in personal computing history. Mm-hmm. And... You know, the Apple II before it was also a pivotal moment in, in personal computing history, but the Mac really was, was um, without question, doing something that no computer had succeeded at in a widespread way before mm. it. Can you think of a game and, and a story like that one that is, is a pivotal moment in the history of games? Um, that's inspired by the... The Macintosh specifically and its innovations. It's, it's however you'd like to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, the 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 most obvious target is is Mist, uh, which was made in HyperCard um, by by Cyan Worlds, the company founded by Robin and Rand Miller, uh, and then went on to become the highest selling PC game of all time until The Sims beat it in 2002. Uh, so so tell, us, tell us a little bit about what HyperCard is first, because, I mean, some of my listeners um, may only be familiar with OS X and not really understand what HyperCard was. Mm. Yeah, so um, I'm maybe not the best person to explain HyperCard, because uh, I'm not intimately familiar with uh, its workings, but it's uh, it's kind of a a programming tool from 1987 or 86 
from from the mid to late eighties was made by the same guy who made Mac Paint and uh, yeah, Bill yeah, Atkins and the Finder, and like he was probably the most important programmer on the Macintosh. Uh, absolutely brilliant guy. And the incredible thing about HyperCard is that you could make software without doing any programming. Um, you had a so, you, you had an interface there, um, and you could. And we can take it take these things for granted now, but back then it was incredible that you had an interface that allowed you to just drag and drop buttons and um, and prompts and things and link them all up without typing any code. And if you did want to actually dig into the scripting of the program, you could write in something that was very similar to natural English. Um, and so uh, the way HyperCard works is you have cards, um, and each card forms a stack. It's like it's like web pages. So you have links that you create between different cards. Those links might be text, they might be images, they might be buttons, just like on the web. And you can have some level of interactivity. Uh, and most people use HyperCard to do things like bookkeeping or record their golf scores. Or um, to a lot of teachers used it to uh, to provide lessons for their their students. But then some people were more creative. Um, there's this wonderful thing called "If Monks Had Max." Uh, I I went into the whole story for it in one of my podcasts, Ludophilia. Um, it. It's designed by a guy called Brian Thomas and a whole bunch of other people who helped him. And it almost defies description. Uh, you've got like, e-books, essays. Uh, there's a jukebox in there that plays um, one-note instruments um, of all these different popular songs. Uh, like you can hear uh, raindrops keep falling on my head in one chord from a Beethoven symphony, if for some reason that's what you want to do. Uh, there's a lot of philosophical stuff in there. There's some illustrations. There's a journal writing tool. All sorts of weird and wonderful things in there. And then uh, getting a bit, um, a bit less out there and weird, there, are, there was a series of hypercard stacks created by, um, what was the name? Uh, Amanda Goodenough. I presume that's how you say it. Uh, she made some children's stacks. And what she wanted to do was take, um, take the stories that her grandmother used to tell her when she was a kid. Stories that were all about what happened next, what's coming next in this story. And she... And, and she tried to make a children's book that would, an interactive children's book that would do the same thing. So she made this delightful little thing called Inigo Gets Out. And it's about a, a cat that has gone out and it's having its little adventure for the day. And you can click on the screen um, for what the cat will do next and where it will go next. And in a similar fashion... Robin and Rand Miller had this idea that they would make a, an interactive children's book in HyperCard. And that basically led to the creation of The Manhole, which is one of the predecessors to Myst. And I really like the, the story behind The Manhole. Um, I don't know if you want me to go into it in full, but the... Please, okay. please. Um, so it started with... It started with Rand, who had this idea, uh, and at this point in time, he's he's an adult, he's working in a bank, and he has the idea that he wants to wants to make this thing. So he gets in touch with his younger brother Robin, who's in university, I think, still at the time. There's a seven year age difference between them. Robin happens to be a very talented artist, so Rand thought you can draw the book. 
and I'll do the the scripting and things that link up all the drawings. But then when Robin actually sat down to try HyperCard out, he was faced with this blank screen and he's, what do I draw? I don't know what to do. And something possesses him to draw a manhole cover. And then instantly he thinks, well, what happens next? Maybe the manhole will open. So he drew another picture with the manhole open. But then instantly uh, he's beckoned for, for more interactivity. And so he's, okay, what happens What happens now? Uh, and you've got a, he drew a big beanstalk that comes out of the manhole. And so you've got choice. You can go up the beanstalk or you can go down the manhole. And he didn't want to turn the page, as it were. He wanted to to explore one way and the other. And so in this in this ad hoc way, he just kept drawing more pictures and expanding the world. And drawing on influences like Alice in Wonderland to create these delightful, whimsical little worlds where you, at one point, you can end up in, a, I think, a rabbit's teacup or something like that. Um, you can talk to a dragon uh, who offers you cookies, I think, and, and but then he accidentally burns them. Uh, and I should mention the dragon is sitting in a comfy chair. He's wearing sunglasses and a chain necklace. And he says something like, hey, baby, welcome to my cool pad. <laughs> and you can you can go under the sea and you you find a painting. There's a there's Walrus of the Year, Sir Walter Walrus the Third. And there um and nearby there's like a a little piano toy, I think, by memory. Um so you have all these little fun toys in the game. And then from that they made another one called Cosmic Osmo, uh, which was quite similar. And then they made Splunks, or Spelunks is how they say it. Uh which is one of the games that I loved when I grew up. That's a uh, also in a similar vein, but it's more educational than the others. The other two were more experiential. Splunks is full of little science toys. Um, so you've got a zoomable map of the solar system. You've got a lightning simulator. Um, there's some something where you can drop a, a pebble down a well and you can adjust what the well level is. And then you see the sound wave coming back up. And so you can learn about the speed of sound using that thing. Uh, and it also had some really silly, playful stuff, like a, a dance sequencer. You could choreograph this little routine using some canned animations for a dancing man. A little quirky things like that. And then, so, that led to Myst, uh, in that after they finished making that game, they had discovered that a Japanese company, Sunsoft, wanted to uh, get them to make a game. They they had loved Cosmic Osmo and the manhole, and they and they said to to Robin and Rand, can you do something like that, but for a mature audience? And Robin and Rand had, had already wanted to do something mature. They had an idea for a, for a game they called Grey Summons a couple of years previously, uh, which had a lot of parallels with with what Mist became, um, but they didn't want to dig that out, so they started again, and they came up with this idea of an island. Um, it would be a bit like Jules Verne's Mysterious Island, so they called it Mist. And uh, for anyone who doesn't know, the basic premise is you arrive at this strange, unknown unknown world, and you find the remnants of an advanced civilization. And then you start exploring and you find that there are like people inside of books and it gets really weird and it's very uh, difficult, full of puzzles and things. I remember this kind of library scene with the fireplace. Yeah, that, that's in there. I never actually finished Mist, even though I've I've written this book and I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> a Mac lover. I, I know. Oh, for <laughs> I shame. never actually finished it. 
not not that I can really claim anything better. I, I bought the the version for PC at that time and was playing it on a PC, so can't really can't really be proud of that either. <laughs> Yeah, that that was one of the the sort of pivotal games because it was that game that really showed what you could do with limited amount of resources, and it really changed the way that that games mm-hmm. were for a while. You know, there was I, I feel like there are some some games that changed the gaming world, and and they were Dark Castle, they're Mist, and they're um, you mm-hmm. know things like Doom that that really were the first of their genre that led the way for what yeah, gaming could be. I, one of the things I find really interesting with Mist and Doom is they were released about six months apart from each other. And so they combined, they they completely changed video games. But they they kind of, they took it in two different directions. So there was almost this split in, in what games were at that point, where you had Mist leading to this path of things that nowadays we describe more as casual games, um, things that that aren't violent, things that that are more patient. Um, argu- arguably, the beginning. Well, I don't know. I think of casual games as things that you can pick up and put down mm-hmm. and come back to, and and not really yeah. commit to. But Mist wasn't that. Mist was one of those things where you really committed to it and got sucked into the world. Mm. Right. I, if anything, I would have thought Doom would be the more casual game because you can pick it up and put it down, and you're just fighting the levels over and over again with different creatures and different keys, but you know, for the most part, it's it's the same approach to shooting. Mm. Well, that's a, that's a fair point. But I, I, um, the way I see it, you've got um, Mist uh, leading to all these uh, similar kinds of games um, that that are full of obtuse puzzles and are weird. And from there, uh, you have hidden objects games emerging. And hidden object games, uh, like the casual gaming genre... Uh, that it, aside from like Bejeweled and 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 other um, casual puzzle games, um, you've got hidden object games, and they mostly evolved out of things like Mist. Uh, whereas on the Doom side, you've got pretty much every uh, violent action game today uh, emerged out of that. Yeah, every first person mm. for sure. It's it's really you know it's one of these things where gaming mm. is so personal. Right, it's it's sort of a reflection of of the mm. things you enjoy, as to which game will resonate with you, and it's 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 so hard to to be able to talk about which games you identified and which games were were the ones that really changed mm. things. It's you know I I played Doom when Doom came out, and then I got through loading all of the pot patches and mods on it, and you know I I had the time I had a uh, a sound card that had MIDI on it. So I exported it out from from playing the MIDI instead of on mm. the internal stuff through the PC speaker. I played it through the sound card through some big amplifiers. So I had huge, huge speakers playing the MIDI files. Um, you know, I played Myst. I, I played all these things. Uh, it's, it's just, mm. we've come so far, right? Yeah, we have. We really have. So... I, I gosh, you know, I have enjoyed this. I can't believe we've passed through thirty <laughs> minutes of talking about this so quickly. Um, where where can people find out more about the book? Where can people go to get a copy uh, of the book? The easiest thing is probably to go to the official website I made, uh, which classic Mac users will enjoy. Has like a, a Mac OS eight theme on it. Uh, that is at secrethistoryofmacgaming dot com. Amazing. You should have made it in HyperCard. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course, but but that's very cool. And and how much does the book uh, retail it's for? Thirty pounds. Um, so like, what's that? Forty US dollars or something like that. Off the top of my head, I don't know the conversion. It's about fifty uh, Australian dollars. Okay. Well, so fifty Australian dollars is thirty-eight dollars US. Yeah. Yeah, I'm cool. being told here by my converter that it's about forty US dollars. Yeah, close enough. We'll figure it out. But what what I want to make sure that I do is encourage all of our listeners to check this book out and to check out the website for the book because it it's it's g- gaming is really part of what has driven the computer mm-hmm. development, right? It, it's it's always been about people finding ways to 
use the hardware that's there, exploit it, and push it to do a little bit more in in the name of enjoyment. And when that becomes something that can be a shared experience, and then a communal experience, and then a land game experience, and then an internet experience, it really is is what ties all of this together. You know, there there are people that had to get the better sound cards so that they could become more immersed in the game, that had to get the better joystick so that they could become more immersed in the game, that then had to get the LAN party going. And you know, had to get the dedicated phone line so that you could have one line on the modem and not worry when mom <laughs> picked up on the other line kind of thing. It, it's it's a history that if you didn't live it, I think you'd really enjoy learning about. And if you did live it, like like I did, then you should go and relive it. Mm. And maybe discover some things you, you didn't know about the first time. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Rich. I really do appreciate this. Thank you. It was great. All right, Mike, this has been the end of the Apple Insider podcast for this week. Yep. For this week, we'll be back next week, obviously, with the rest of the stuff from <laughs> WWDC. All right. Magic Mike Worthley, where can people find you on the internet? Well, frankly, you can find me pretty much seven days a week at appleinsider.com. And if you want to hear the salty version of this podcast, <laughs> oh dear, it, it, you can hear me every Monday at spacejavelin.com. I'm, I'm going to have to try and use my parental controls to make sure that I don't get exposed to that one. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's not we, – we actually skip the salty language. We, we avoid the salty language. It's just – it's it gets a bit more heated. So that's it. Yeah. Well, I'm your host, Victor. You can find me at VMarks on Twitter. Please email us at news at appleinsider.com. We'll be happy to respond to your questions. We might even read your question on the air. Thank you so much. We'll be back next week. So long, everybody. Good night.